it so that way, because no one else handed one in. Yeah, let's do it. Good evening. We're going to get started here in one minute, but if you have a question card that you filled out, if you could hold it up, I am going to come and pick it up. So far, I only have one question. Well, oh, I got one over there. Okay. Friends, we welcome you to Elizabethtown Church of the Brethren, where we practice peace, service, and openness to all. I am Pastor Naomi Creenbring, and I am joined this evening by my colleagues on the pastoral team here at E-Town COB, Jason Haldeman and Liz Bidgood Enders. We are so glad that you are here for this evening with John Pavlovitz, and it is a joy to share this time and space with you. We welcome those of you who are here in person, as well as those who are joining on the live stream or are watching the recording at a later time. You are welcome to wear a mask if that is most comfortable for you, and please know there are some available on a table out in the lobby. We hope that you will find this to be a meaningful evening. We want to take a moment to recognize that part of our work as a faith community that practices peace, service, and openness to all includes a call to recognize and lament the pain felt locally after the recent deaths of at least two Lancaster County teenagers who were part of the LGBTQ community. We mourn the loss of those beautiful lives. We send care and love to their family and friends, and we continue to live with the hope and assurance that power is found in love. We will be accepting donations tonight, which will be split between two organizations. First, Music for Everyone, as requested in the obituary by the family of River Page Olmsted, one of those beautiful lives. Music for Everyone exists to cultivate the power of music as an educational, community building, public health, and social justice tool to transform lives, schools, and communities in Lancaster County. The second organization is BMC, the Brethren Mennonite Council for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Interests, whose mission is to cultivate an inclusive church and society and to care for the Mennonite and Brethren LGBTQ plus and allied community. If you're interested in donating, you may place your donation in baskets that are available in the back of the sanctuary or the lobby and in the fellowship hall downstairs, where you invited for refreshments after the program. We as a congregation desire wholeness, peace, and joy for all who are hurting and healing. We seek this for us as individuals, for our communities, and for the world. We hope that thoughtfully engaging with John's ideas and with one another will lead us on the next step in that journey together. Thank you for being here tonight. Good evening. My name is Amy Carr, and I am a congregant here at Elizabethtown Church of the Brethren. My quest to bring John to our congregation began over four years ago uh, when I, along with two others from this church, traveled to Reading, PA to hear him speak there. Um, it was an incredible night, and we left feeling so energized and knowing that we wanted John in this building. You can imagine um, we had our first planning meeting in February 2020, so you can imagine what happened after that, uh, which began a lot of conversations with John of starting and stopping and starting and stopping, and finally we felt this year that we were in a place where we were able to make this happen. So I thank you all for being here. I can attest to the power of John's words and having him here in the room with us, and so it is my pleasure to introduce John Pavlovitz. Well, good evening, my friends. It is so good to be back home. I don't know if you know that, but I spent a lot of time here in Pennsylvania. It's where my road to ministry began, which I'll share a little bit more with you in a bit. But I am so glad to be here with the lovers 
and the healers and the helpers and the activists and the caregivers and the damn givers. If that's you tonight, just let me know, please. I want to welcome everyone who's watching us online and thank you for taking the time to be here. This is my first trip to Pennsylvania in about five years. And since then, we've had a planetary health crisis that shut down the world. We've had a coup attempt and we've had a movement of white nationalism flow through our country and our government. So what that means is, I hope you booked a sitter for a long time because we're going to be here a while, right? <laughs> We've got some work to do. Tonight is exciting, right? It is, and it's not exciting because I'm here. It's exciting because we all get to gather and share the same space and time. And see, what happens tonight is unprecedented because humanity has never been arranged in this specific configuration in the history of the planet. We will never all gather again, and we have never gathered before. And what that means is this is historic. And if we do this right, what we're going to share tonight is going to alter the world out there, right? And that's what we want. We're not just here to come together and to make one another feel good and to encourage one another. We are going to do that. But if we leave here unaffected, and if we do nothing differently when we leave here, then we've wasted this time. And so I hope you're here to be challenged, to be changed, to be inspired, and to dream a little bit about the world that can be from the world that is right now. So let me rewind a little bit. I was an agnostic with suspicions. I was sitting in the highly polished second pew of a small suburban Pennsylvania church where my wife and I had recently been married. Now the service was ending and I was thinking very spiritual thoughts, like where we were going to go to lunch <laughs> and could the Eagles offensive line handle the Giants defensive pressure? Very deep theological debates. And I felt a tap on my shoulder and I turned around and this woman said, John, I've been thinking about you and praying about you, and I think you would make an amazing youth leader. And I smiled and thought to myself, I know you. You're the current youth leader. <laughs> she had done her time. She had paid her debt to society. She was getting out on good behavior, and she was looking for a victim, a sucker, a minister of the Lord. And I fit the two main criteria for small church youth work. I was young and I was there. <laughs> and she said, what would you think about coming to our youth meeting tonight? And I thought, what could that alter about the complete trajectory of my life? So I foolishly said yes. And it was one of those pivot point moments in your life. You know, when you have them and they're disguised in the moment as ordinary moments. And so you just breeze through them, but you don't realize that everything is going to change. And I walked downstairs and it altered the course of my life because I started to realize over the next few days and months is that I loved working with teenagers, that I had an affinity for the turbulent time of adolescence, that the people most reasonable adults avoided I wanted to spend time with. I was like a demented storm chaser. <laughs> so that looks horrible, let's go there, you know? <laughs> And something really interesting happened as I began to teach these young people about a faith that I did not really have at the time, my faith began to grow. And with that, the youth ministry began to grow and opportunities came. And I finally found myself leaving my full-time career as an art director to enter ministry full-time. And that was 25, 20, actually 27 years ago now. And it all started in Pennsylvania. So this is a place that's very dear to me. Now, the past decade of my journey has been spent ministering to a sprawling, disparate, virtual congregation of people all over the world. And in the work I do in my travels, both in person and online, I do quite a bit of speaking, but I try to do a lot of listening too. I hear or read hundreds of stories every month, and at this point, I don't consider myself 
an author or a blogger or even a pastor primarily, but a collector of stories. I'm a war correspondent. I step into a different town or reach people where they are are online, and I step into the trenches of life with people, and I say, tell me what's happening here on the ground so that I can tell the folks back home. And that's the place that I write and minister from. And people give me proximity to their pain. They show me their stories. They share with me their grief. And I sit with them, and I listen for the places their voices break. And I ask myself what they're trying to say that they cannot quite put words to. What would they tell people if their humanity could reach beyond geographic proximity? I do my best to be a translator of diverse experience, to find the common narratives in disparate experience. So Pennsylvania, it's been a while. Tell me what's happening here on the ground. What are you seeing? What are you thinking about? What are you worried about? What are you excited by? I want to ask you, it's not a rhetorical question, why are you here tonight? Just put up your hand and I'll ask you why you're here and I'll repeat it so our friends online and in the back can hear. Why why did you come here tonight? Yes. To find hope. Yes. You're grieving. Something tells me you're in good company. Why else are you here, friends? Yes. Ma'am. Yes. Um, Just seeing people do really hateful things in the name of Christ. Seeing people doing hateful things in the name of Christ. Sir. All right, Christian nationalism trying to take over the school board, so it's got you worried. There was someone down here, sir. To hear your perspective. To hear my perspective, thank you. Uh, Just to deal with, to be with other people who are feeling the same discouragement about what's happening politically and to our LGBT friends and community and my fear of what a change in administration will mean for the rights that Okay, to be around other discouraged people and, and really the, and, and be, lift each other. and lift each other up. Yes, if we leave here more discouraged, that's going to be a problem. So I'm going <laughs> to, it's John Pavlovitz. He's a demotivational speaker. <laughs> Sir. To find out what the difference is between Christianity, the entities, the Christianity and humanity. Okay, what's the difference between Christianity and humanity? Ooh, you would hope they would be closely tied together, but something tells me we're gonna expose the fact that that's not true. Well, all of these stories, we, we could all tell a different story why we're here. And what I want you to think about is the road that led you here. What you have experienced, what you've walked through, the things you care about, because that is key in all the things we're gonna share tonight over the next four and a half hours. One of the truths I often share with people is that we exist in this world in both systems and in stories. So the stories are unprecedented human beings, once in history, never to be repeated creations with both singular uniqueness and with the same inherent value. If you're a person of faith, that means you see each person bearing the image of God carrying the spark of the divine. And every single one of those stories merits respect befitting the fact that they are completely original. Every life is a story. Every life in this room is a story. But these lives, they exist in community and they exist in systems Larger realities, environments with rules and barriers and supports that all come to bear on those individual lives. So the systems govern and influence and they either nurture or they impede the stories. 
And so tonight we're going to wrestle with the stories and the systems that we, as people of faith, morality, and conscience, need to be aware of and need to be motivated to move toward and to change. So let's think about a couple of words, equality. We might think about equality as related to those stories, the inherent value of a human being, their right to receive every human and civil right that every other human being has. It's a proper reverence for each person. But equity is a little bit different. Equity speaks to the reality that each person, each story has not traveled the same road to this spot, right? And there are obstacles and adversity that have not been identical. And as difficult as equality is to achieve, we can manage that because we can reach people in their story and find the beauty in that story. But equity is a far more difficult aspiration because equity takes on the question of fairness and then justice, which are incredibly subjective, and they may also require us to change the system, a system that we may have enjoyed and benefited from in order to move that system closer to equity. Some people may have to be inconvenienced with a more equitable system. So if you call your local cable service provider to set up service, invariably there's gonna be a conversation with a customer service representative. They're gonna ask you if you want to bundle phone and internet also, and because they'll be much cheaper than if you purchase those things separately or from another vendor, right? This upselling is known as what? Bundling, right. Isn't bundling great? <laughs> bundling is so beautiful because it makes me feel like I'm getting something inexpensively or free when I'm actually getting overcharged for it. <laughs> I want you to think about the, the word bundling for a minute. Because I, I recently turned 54 years old and I've spent, I'm embarrassed to say, far too many of those years before I even began to understand that as a white, cisgender, heterosexual man who was born in America and claims Christianity, that I was born with the privilege bundle. Every, every possible advantage was given to someone bearing my characteristics. My privilege bundle was prepaid long before I, was ar before I arrived. I was grandfathered into it, literally. I was great, great, great grandfathered into it. The color of my skin and my gender and my orientation, my profession of faith, my very physicality, all buffered me from many varieties of adversity. They formed a barrier against a great deal of struggle that others experience as routine. And they opened doors for me that I never realized had been opened. And they afforded me a vast multitude of advantages, some of which I've become aware of and some which, despite my best efforts, I'll always be slightly oblivious to. But that, friends, was not the story I would have told you growing up. Growing up, I would have told you that anyone who wanted to work hard had the same opportunities in America. Even though if my mother were here, she would say, when I was younger, I didn't work very hard and I always managed to succeed pretty well. I would have told you growing up that anyone who wanted an education could get one, even though I attended a private school many families couldn't afford, all while having two parents who were fully engaged in my life and never wanting for a meal or clothes or transportation or well-paid teachers or any conditions that allowed me to thrive. Growing up, I would have told you that if you were ever pulled over by the police, all you had to do was obey the rules and obey the laws and you'd be fine. And yet, I can remember being in the back of our car when my father was pulled over for speeding in a school zone, and before the officer could even reach him, my dad opened the window and said, just give me the effing ticket. <laughs> and the officer just gave him the effing ticket. 
Do you see what was happening in my life? Even though so much of my experiential evidence testified loudly in opposition to my working assumption about the world, I held tightly to those stories about equity and equality because I needed them to be accurate. I stayed committed to a narrative that I needed to be true because the alternative was to have my white world turned upside down. This is the seductive power of privilege, right? The more you benefit from a system, the easier it is to defend that system. The greater advantages the status quo provides you, the easier it is to, the more tempted you're going to be to resist changes in it, right? When you've always had the best and most comfortable seat at the table, it's really difficult to imagine that there are people waiting outside. Friends, when you are a beneficiary of inequity, equity often isn't a priority. When you are a beneficiary of inequity, you'll be naturally oblivious to injustices experienced by those inequity most dangers. Now, many of you are becoming aware of these things or you wouldn't be here. You see the systems and how they are not right, and you see that your story has benefited from some of those in just unjust systems. But see, we're all a product of our stories, and our stories can be our greatest teachers if we let them. Because all our stories have a specific geography. They have a specific place in time where we find ourselves. We have a neighborhood that we have lived in our entire lives where we've had our assumptions built and our prejudices formed and our blind spots created. It's where we've built relationships and impacted lives and engaged the brokenness of the world. And for the past 25 years, my neighborhood has been the church as a pastor, serving mostly predominantly white churches in the South. Now, all the churches where I served, we were diverse. All you had to do was ask us. (laughs) Or read our website. Hi, we're, we're a diverse church. But the reality was we often spanned the racial diversity from white to beige (laughs) and everything in between. It wasn't that we didn't desire diversity. It's just that we didn't know how to get to diversity. Or as we began to grow closer to it, we found that we wanted a more comfortable diversity. And there were some tensions in me as a minister, realizing that there are fewer entities in America that have been more powerful agents of inequity than the Christian church at times, along lines of race and gender and sexual orientation and socioeconomic level. Religion is often, as it has bent the moral arc of the universe toward justice, it has pulled it away. And friends, equity needs to matter. We, we are not all people of faith in this room. We don't have to be. But if we are, and if we claim any sort of relationship with the teachings of Jesus, equity needs to matter because Jesus' command to love the least of these reminds us that the least are not those who are worth less, but who are treated as less by the powers and conditions and circumstances and systems around them. They are the least seen, the least respected, the least invited, the least receiving of the things that the most of these receive without asking for it or needing to demand it. And equity doesn't come without empathy. And this is what brings us here. The heart that we have for this world. Tomorrow morning, we're going to dive deeply into empathy. There's going to be a workshop at 930 in the morning. You can just stay over if you want. Um, (laughs) But I wanted to to talk a little bit about empathy because what we're talking about right now and why you came in here, it's not about politics and it's not about theology. Those are the big picture far away things, but this is about how this trickles down into your relationships with other human beings, right? I mean, this is where the fractures are. The story of these days is not an administration. It is not political parties. Those are just symptoms of the tribalism and the other things that we have going on. And that's why you're not talking to those old friends anymore. That's why your family gatherings look a little and feel a little different. It's why your neighborhood is a little uncomfortable at times. I wanted you to just, we're gonna run through just a few things 
with regard to empathy. I want to tell you a few things that I share with people as I gather throughout the country to help you carry the pain of this world. The first thing I, I'm going to tell you tonight is to look for the fears and false stories. Look for the fears and false stories. See, in the work I do as a pastor and caregiver and storyteller, people tell me things they don't think they can tell anyone. And that's really good news for you because I get to tell you what they said. <laughs> and often I meet people in my travels and it's usually in the context of something like this and I'll walk through a church and someone will come up to me and they'll say something deeply personal to me instantly that I haven't shared with anyone else. And without any of their backstory, without having any relationship with them, they want me to give them something that they can take back with them to help them. And I say, look for the fears and the false stories in everyone. Find out what people are afraid of and figure out why those fears might be misplaced or addressed because no one is at their best when they're terrified. See, when we're in conflict with other people, whether we're debating politics or religion or finances or work problems or parenting issues or strong opinions on any topic, the other person is almost always afraid of something. And that fear drives them and us to hold or defend a certain position. See, the fears that people carry, they're not always unfounded. Sometimes they're accurate. They're not false stories, but the false story is what the person tells themselves about the fear that is not proportional to the threat. And people's fears and false stories will manifest in the politicians they support, in the religious beliefs they hold, in the way they respond to adversity. And part of the job of being loving, empathetic human beings of faith and morality and conscience is to try and uncover people's fears and validate them so that they don't agree with us, but so that they are less frightened. And I bet you could look at some people right now that you have a certain perception of and realize there is something that they are terrified of, and that is why they're responding in the way that they are. Because those fears and false stories that they're inherited they're passed down through generation. They're delivered by fire and brimstone preachers. They are delivered by partisan media. And they begin to drown people in that kind of enmity. And the bottom line is, friends, whether we pe feel people's fears are justified or not, the net result on them is the same as the net result of your fears on you. And if we are to live empathy-centered lives, we need to consider that. So be looking for the fears and false stories. Second thing I ask people to do is be mindful of the grief that we all carry. Be mindful of the grief we all carry. Back before the world shut down, I was in Boise and I was getting ready to speak and I was having a conversation with a, a couple in the front row and this woman said, you know, John, I'm 59 years old. I've been, I've been suicidal several times in my life, but I've rarely been homicidal. I said, wow. That's, mom, that's crazy. We, we kind of had a, like a strange laugh and we, what we admitted and she admitted was, she said, I've just been surprised by the level of my anger that I've been capable of a rage that I never actually had before. And I seem to have that more consistently than I've had before. And then in Minnesota, I was walking through the lobby of a, of a large church there and a woman did what I had mentioned. She kind of grabbed me. She said, can I talk to you for a second? And I said, sure. And we're doing like a walk and talk. And she, you know, just started to cry. And people do that a lot. I try not to take it personally anymore. They just start crying. <laughs> and she said, John, I just, she said, I'm just so angry all the time. She said, I don't even recognize myself anymore. She said, I hate the person I've become. I'm so angry. And I looked at her and I said, well, you might be, but you might be something else. Maybe you're grieving. And she looked at me and she said, I never thought like that. And it's all of a sudden she said, that's it. And she could name the people that she's lost 
and the security that she's lost and her family, the way that it has changed and the, the emotional attrition that she has had, the relational attrition that she's seen. And I don't know why you're here today, but I imagine you're here partly because you're grieving something. You're grieving the idea of the loss of your idea of God, or you're grieving the idea of family, or you're grieving your old idea of country, or maybe you've you're grieving the death of the belief in the goodness of people. Maybe you're grieving a relationship with someone you once felt at home with. Maybe you're grieving your sense of optimism about the future or the lightness you used to feel in the morning. I tell people all the time, there are eight billion funerals happening right now. The loss you feel, you're not alone in it, and guess what? The grief that you carry, it's carried by everyone in this room and everyone watching and by everyone you love and it's carried by people you don't like and it's carried by people you despise. No one gets out of this life without loss. And part of the work we do is to look at the people around us and realize, yeah, there is a, there is a lot of grieving happening. Now the story everyone tells themselves about why that grief exists, that may be something we debate. But you're here because something has died and you want it back. And this is re- important to remember because we have to see people as more than how they vote. We have to see people as more than the bumper stickers they have in their car. We have to see people as more than the TV shows that they watch. So look for the fears and the false stories. Be mindful of the grief we all carry. The third thing is to actively confront the epidemic of loneliness. Some of you came here tonight simply because you know that community is medicinal, because you felt the moment you walked in here, I can exhale, because some people will get me, right? The reason we go to the movies or we read a book or we look at artwork or we listen to music is to see something of ourselves reflected back, right? To feel connected to other people, to find affinity in the experience of being human. And the reason we create and express ourselves is to make that kind of connection in the opposite direction, to say to the world, here is my story. And knowing that we're part of this shared experience is what tethers us to hope when difficulty comes, isn't it? This shared story is called community, and community is the antidote to loneliness. And this is important because the many people that we grieve over right now, when you ask yourself, how did they become part of something that is so antithetical to goodness? Or how did they join a movement that seems predatory to everyone, even toward them? When you ask yourself how this could be possible, it's because somehow that movement or that group has made them feel like they belong, has given them a sense of place or identity or makes them feel that they're seen. And so we have to fight whatever the impulses are that come from loneliness, and we have to reach people and offer them an alternative that is life-giving. After I moved from Pennsylvania to Charlotte, I was serving in in a church. I had the transformational experience of my ministry life. It was the first event that I was doing as a youth pastor. Now, I'd gone from a church here in Pennsylvania. It was a nice church, right? But this was a mega church in the South. It was like, I was like the Jeffersons. I was moving on up. (laughs) And we had our first big event. We had this uh, industrial park where we had purchased this, rented this property, and we had it majorly tricked out for students, right? So we had gaming systems on the wall and a full basketball court and a giant stage and pool tables and snack bars and everything you could imagine. And all the students were coming for the first event with their parents, hundreds of students and parents, and the place is packed. And I'm doing like my youth 
leader hummingbirding, which is hummingbirding is um, socializing for introverts where you can go, hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. Hi. Oh, it's so nice. I'm near and new, and I can feel like I'm talking to people, but I'm making no commitment whatsoever. <laughs> You'll see me hummingbirding after the talk today. <laughs> but we're doing, you know, in this gathering, and I'm giving this big message, and I look on the periphery of the room, and there are two students who are standing in the back of the room, kind of like this. And so I said, well, that's a challenge for me. So I went up to them and I was in youth, youth pastor mode. Um, the amazing staff here has never been in that kind of youth pastor mode, I'm sure. But what that is, is like, you've got all your material and you're ready. And I'm like, hey, thanks for coming out. I'm so glad you're here. We're gonna have a great year. I'm so excited to be here. And I'm trying to sell them. Look, we've got gaming systems and we've got the stage and the basketball court snack bar. We're frying food over here. And they're just looking at me and they're not smiling. So I just keep going, right? And then they, nothing. And then like the flop sweat starts to come. And I'm like, oh, I'm dying here. I'm like, somebody save me, please. Rapture, if that's even a thing. And then, so finally, nothing, they give me nothing. And I go, okay, well, thanks for coming out. And I just leave thinking I'd failed them. And, uh, but it bothered me that they were standing back there like that. And three days later, I got an email from one of the students, the older. She was the sister. And she said, I don't know if you remember us, but we were at the event on Sunday. And she said, I just wanted you to know that we didn't want to be there. We were forced to be there by our parents, which as a minister is what you want. <laughs> People under duress. And she said, we had a horrible experience at our former church, specifically with the youth pastor. And she said, we didn't want to be there at all. But she said, you came over, and it really did seem like you care about us, and I wanted to thank you. She said, you made me feel visible, and I rarely feel visible. And that was the day that changed everything about how I did this work, and it still does every day, to make people feel seen and heard and known. That is the greatest gift, and so we confront the epidemic of loneliness by making sure people feel seen, not as a stereotype, not as a caricature, but deeper into who they are. So be thinking about how you can make people feel visible because human beings want to be known. They want to be heard. I do and you do. And again, so are the people you love and so are the people you don't like and so are the people you despise. Other, other thing I want you to do is I want you to be a student of people. Uh, we, we feel the divide, right? We, we know there's a divide in this country, right? It's not just me, please. I mean, yes, I require therapy, yes, but. See, but we know there's a divide, but we don't understand what it is. It is not a political divide. It is not simply Republican versus Democrat. It's not conservative versus progressive. It's not Christian versus non-Christian. It's not conservative Christian versus progressive Christian. This is a vision divide. It's a divide in way that we see the world and our place in it. See, some people, they see, they are fueled by a faith of fear. And other people of faith are fueled by a faith of love and empathy. And those are the forces that are pulling on them. Some people see the entire world as interdependent community, and some people do see America first, and those forces pull against each other. There are people who do wake up in the morning and see the world as continual lack, as if someone else's gain is their loss. It's a zero-sum game. And some people live saying, if we're creative enough, there is enough for everyone. And so it's trying to figure out how we can understand the other, how we can figure out why they tell themselves those stories. And see, the fundamental mistake we make when we interact with people we don't agree with is believing we know them. The think that we've got them all figured out, right? The moment that you decide you figured someone out, you have made them smaller than they actually are. People think they know me because they've read blog posts or books that I've written, but they have a limited window. A woman came up to me recently, she said, John, I've read everything you've ever written. 
I said, well, first of all, that's much more than my wife has read. <laughs> and I said, now you've, writ you've read 100% of what I choose to share with the world. So even that's a small piece. And see, we look at people from a distance on social media, and we've got a small window in who they are, and we try to judge who we think they are. And we know people that are some other church right now or some other gathering, and because of the signs on the church or the theology, we go, I think I know them. Or even the people we know well, we've kind of decided we are stop being curious about them. And so curiosity makes us want to be a story learner. Now, I don't know if you know this, but um, in 2016, some strange things happened in America. <laughs> you may read them if they're still history books, a couple years. <laughs> well, I have my, I'm a friend of mine, his name is Sally, and Sally is in her 70s, and she is a white woman, and she was raised Southern Baptist. She's now a Unitarian, which is quite a spiritual journey. <laughs> So after the election, she came up to me and she goes, John, I'm just torn up about what I'm seeing in the world. We're so divided and uh, I don't know what to do about it, but I think here's what I'm going to do. And she said, I'm going to invite a group of women over to my home every Sunday to play bridge and to talk about uh, the deepest contents of our hearts. And she said, these are women who are theologically and politically opposite of me. They're people who are still in the Southern Baptist churches I used to be part of. So that's what she's done ever since then. Now you're hearing that and you're ready for me to tell you some beautiful stories. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, it's been difficult. Like she would come up to me some days, she'd go, John, have you seen what's going on in the news? If you still pray, would you pray for me? Because I'm gonna have to talk about this in my home with these people. But she did tell me, she said, about six months in, she said, I have a great story to share. And she said, we were talking about the racial divide in our country. We were talking about the murders of people of color, and it was very heavy. And she said, then the woman across from us, across from me, started to cry. And my friend Sally said, why are you crying? And she said, I just don't know why God made other races. <laughs> right? And I was thankful that I wasn't there. <laughs> you know, had I been there, I would have said, well, you know, if Adam and Eve existed, they weren't Caucasian, right? Yeah. Or I would have said, the cradle of civilization didn't come with a cracker barrel. <laughs> but I, I wasn't there, and she was there, and she said the greatest follow-up question. She said, tell me more. And the woman said, well, if God hadn't made other races, then we wouldn't have racism. We would all love each other, and we wouldn't have any of these problems. And what Sally heard in that is that this woman, her heart was genuinely breaking by what she was seeing, but she had a bad story about why it existed. She wasn't a bad person, she was a good person with a bad story. And we know a lot of people who are good people with bad God stories. And when we look at toxic religion and white nationalism, that's people, some of them are good people with really bad stories that have polluted the way that they see God or themselves or other people. And so as we learn stories, we can be more sensitive to the fact that people are complex and they are inside that story so they can't even see it. And that leads me to the, the day I was, I was in art school. I was going to be an artist when I grew up. I'm still waiting. But one day we were in art class and we, it was a Thursday afternoon and we were getting ready to draw a still life. There were a bunch of ordinary objects there and we started getting our stuff out and our instructor said, oh, before you draw anything, come on up here. And he put us all around the table and he said, this is a, a collection of ordinary objects that people have lost sight of the beauty of. And he said, if you want to show them the beauty and the things they no longer see the beauty of, you have to get close. And he says, you want to pick things up and see how they feel. Are they rough? Are they smooth? Are they cool? Or are they warm? Are they heavy? Or are they light? Look at the way the light hits them. He said, really get to study them. And he said, you have to become a student of what you draw. And then you can share the beauty of those things with other people in the way that only you can. Friends, we have to be students of other people. 
We have to never stop being curious about what they believe and what is possible that we can actually learn from them. And the last thing I want you to think about before we take a, we're going to open the floor here. I was, um, I took our family, we went, my wife and I, we have two children, we went to Universal Studios in Florida years ago. Now you know how these vacations go, right? You get up before the sun, <laughs> you cram everybody in the car, and you get to the airport, and you get on a plane, and you get off the plane, and you get down a tram, and you get to a bus, and you go to a hotel, and you get another tram, and you go and pay money to ride fake transportation. <laughs> So we got to Universal Studios like after 12 hours and I'm just ready to stop. And the first thing we did that day was called Shrek 4D. Shrek, it was like at the time it was state of the art. It was a 4D movie. It's like a 3D movie with glasses and they spray you and they move your seat. It's very experiential and supposed to be realistic. So we walk in and they give us our yellow plastic 3D glasses and we sit down and the the, it says, please put on your 3D glasses, house lights go down, and the, the thing starts, and I'm not impressed, okay? I, I wasn't, it wasn't as breathtaking as I thought it would be, <laughs> given the price point. <laughs> I was like, this is like $7 worth, and I spent like 183 <laughs> So I'm watching this, and I, I look around, and everyone else seems like they're having a great time. I'm like, well, look at their standards are much lower than mine. <laughs> And I look at my wife who can always mirror my displeasure at engagements like this and she's having fun. And I said, well, who knows her taste? She married me, right? <laughs> so finally the, house, the movie ends, everyone's clapping, the house lights come back up and my wife looks at me and she goes, what's that on your head? And I said, what? She goes, reach up there. And I reach up and I feel and there are these yellow 3D glasses. <laughs> I had put on my ordinary sunglasses. <laughs> to watch a 4D movie. Now, my wife, as you can imagine, is long suffering. And I said, can we go again? She said, yes. So we went around, got in the queue again, got through the line, got in the glasses, sat down, and you know what? It was awesome. It was so realistic. But the lenses through which we view the world matter. And that's the, the last thing I want you to think about as we, before we open up the floor as we live in community alongside disparate people, it's tempting to imagine that everyone sees things the way we do, that their filters match our own, that we're having a similar experience of the same planet or the same country or the same religion or even the same Jesus. But the truth is we each have incredibly story-shaped lenses that subjectively form and color and alter life in front of us. You've carried your lenses in here with you even as you watch me speak. And these lenses are built by the church you grew up in and the family you were raised in and the words spoken into your life and your experiences and whether you felt loved or neglected or your physicality, everything has been altered and created the lens that you have with you. And there are Eight billion different stories. And you know what? It's really interesting. Even if you all said that you're a Christian, I know you don't, but even if we said, everyone here said, yeah, I'm a Christian, there would be as many different Jesuses in this room as there are people because you see Jesus through a lens. That's why this is all so difficult because there are all these stories colliding. When you meet someone, you slam right into their story, right into their lenses, and you have to do the job of saying, Show me what you see, right? That, that story learning is so that you can begin to understand the way people see the world. Do they see threat everywhere? Do they see lack? Are they worried about abundance? Are they petrified of something, whether that's real or not? It's kind of funny how the Almighty, if we believe in one, a creator, a God, that God's prejudices and biases end up mirroring our own. Have you noticed that? <laughs> How similarly petty and vindictive the gods in our heads becomes. See, in the stories of the Bible even, where Christians are supposed to gather, we all read with our lenses, and what that means is in the stories of Jesus, we all imagine we're Jesus, 
or at least one of his disciples. Like, in the story, we are the good Samaritan stopping to help the, beggar, the, the hurt man on the side of the road. We're not the religious hypocrites walking by, never. In the stories of Jesus, we are always the woman who's been scorned and not the stone throwers, right? In the stories that we read, because of our lenses, we are always Jesus' allies and never his adversaries in the work that he's doing. So that's why it's important. So look for the fears and false stories. Be mindful of the grief that we all carry. Confront the epidemic of loneliness. Be a learner of story. Be a student of people. And consider the lenses that you look through. And here's why all this matters. We're going to take a break and then I'm going to close this together because we've got a bunch of stuff to talk about. Again, this is not going to be solved politically. You're, you're part of activism. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that you're engaged politically, that you know what's going on in the world, that you either partner with a church or a philanthropic organization, that you're in the world trying, but what you need to remember and what I need to remember is that is not what we're talking about. Because those are the big and the distant, but it's the small and the close. And we need to figure out how to make love happen in the small and the close, how to be agents of empathy, how to be makers of shalom. And that means we work in the stories and the systems. It means we see people and the structures around them. I think we have, someone's gonna read some questions to me because Sometimes when people grab the microphone, it's impossible to get it back, frankly. No, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> with, with this many people, we just thought this was good. So I'm going to try to answer as many of these as we can. Amy. We only have a few so far. So if you have more, I'll come back after I ask one. You can hold it up. Oh, yeah. Or Naomi can come grab it. Um, so this one, I think, is this is a, a little bit of a, a two-parter. So okay. I'll ask both because I think they go together. Um, in your opinion, what is progressive Christianity getting wrong? And also, what are the blind spots of progressive Christianity? Okay. Well, what I think progressive Christianity, one of the, the misgivings that I have, people look at me sometimes as, uh, well, John, you're a voice of progressive Christianity. I tell them I'm not. I say I'm the voice of one human being trying to figure out stuff and being a mess and just letting people know what I'm thinking about. And if those things resonate with people, then they can claim parts of that. But the, it's hard to look at progressive Christianity as a monolith the same way as looking at conservative Christianity. I remember being on a bus with a group of speakers and we were traveling around Texas, which is where progressives are really welcome. <laughs> we were way far away from Austin. I was like, please, where's Austin? <laughs> anyway, and this one uh, writer, he's been around for years. He's been huge in the movements of progressive Christianity. And he was telling this story and he said, you know, it was like uh, the early 80s or the late 70s. And I had just written a book about how progressive Christianity has to change Christianity. And, not, and I said, since the 70s, we're still doing this? <laughs> and part of what it is, I think the difficulty is asking the question, is Christianity helpful anymore? The term how can we have a movement that is progressive and yet claims a word that is being co-opted by a, a whole movement that is antithetical to the teachings of Jesus? So I don't think progressive Christianity is wrong. I just think it has a difficulty understanding that maybe it needs to present itself in a way that doesn't label itself anymore. So in other words, you've heard me talk tonight, you've heard my personal spirituality, but there's not a theological doctrinal statement that you need to subscribe to. I think progressive Christianity needs to let people know that you can be loud and loving at the same time. Uh, here's why. I was with a pastor in his church and we were getting ready to speak. It was a progressive church. It was moving toward being progressive, I should say. And I said, I want to tell you what I'm going to talk about today in Sunday morning because I don't want to blow up your church. And I tell him all these things and I go, I'm going to say this. Is that okay? And he goes, please, because I want to, but I can't. <laughs> and I said, why can't you? He says, I just can't. I said, you could. You might end up out here like me. 
But that's progressive Christianity, I think, right now, or even mainline Christianity. It's ministers who realize, okay, I have to say a sanitized truth. I can't step fully into this or else it's going to be a liability for me. So I ask ministers to say, say everything. People's lives are in the balance. So if anything progressive Christianity should do, it's to get more of its gut and get more of its courage and be unapologetic because if people leave your church because you're speaking truth, it's okay. You have to go where you're going to go and then people are gonna come alongside you who are gonna go there. Um, That's a little bit of what I was thinking about. Great, thank you. Uh, On the same vein of progressive churches, what about progressive churches that hold large endowments? Release them (laughs) to me. Um, Well, here's the thing about money and the church. I'll tell you why. Tell you what the problem is. Let's say we talked tonight and there were some of you who claimed faith and you said, John, I'm all in. And we started talking and we said, well, we're all here. We're all from Elizabethtown. And let's say this beautiful community didn't exist here. ECOB doesn't exist. And we go, we're going to start a church. Great. What, it's going to be different than every other church. It's going to be so loving and so beautiful. And we're going to have diversity and great. And we start planning it. And we start, we have the vision. And the 10 or 12 of us are aligned in our vision. And what happens is if we start getting people alongside of us and we begin to grow, soon we grow to the point where we go, well, we can't even fit these people in this little home. So we're going to have to get a building. And then we're going, how are we going to get a building? We've got to finance a building. And then you go, okay, well, to finance a building, we're going to need to give, have people give. And then they start giving. And then you become slowly beholden to the building or to paying for things or for, you know, And so it begins to have a mission drift. And so once money is involved, that's why you don't see any mega churches in the Bible. (laughs) It's really difficult to grow large or to have opulence and be in touch with the message of Jesus. Maybe that's why the early church was just gathering in homes because the more we grow further from that, there's a mission drift. And so I would say a progressive church is in just much danger as a conservative church about having a large sum of money because then it becomes about how do we keep that when we should be saying we have to release that to the world. Um, Interesting question. Okay. This one's a little bit long, but I think it's good. All right. We've got Um, So we facilitate a leadership program for all and encourage underrepresented adults to develop their leadership potential. We get target attacks from Bible Belt fundamentalists and hard Republicans who oppose the LGBTQ community when criticized that those folks are going against God's word. What is a good godly response? (laughs) Good night. (laughs) <laughs> well, there are a couple of things. When, when we think about people who have a theology that we see as hateful or toxic or damaging, we have to remember that they didn't all arrive at that theological position in the same way, and they're not going to be reached in the same way. So in other words, some people want verses, right? They've been taught, here's the magic verse. And so maybe we want to understand the Bible enough that we can give them a verse that shows them an oppositional idea. Now, some people are going to be reached through story, and we're going to have to show them the results of their theology on human beings and ask them to give their humanity a chance to come to bear on that. What I always lean on is the idea that Jesus always left people with greater dignity than he left them. They always, whatever the exchange was, Jesus always saw their humanity. And what I would ask people to do is to say, can you acknowledge the humanity of an LGBTQ human being? And can you respond in a way that Jesus responded? And we can get in battles of verses. There's probably not a lot of people who are going to be convinced by that. It's really going to be about you understanding what is the fear. And so I remember I was talking to a pastor. I'd come in. He was my pastor at the megachurch. And I came in and he said, "Um, John, you know, I've noticed there are a lot of uh, gay students in our youth group. And I said, well, if we did a survey, there are not more per capita homosexuals. 
as he referred to them actually. I said, they just know that they're seen here and that they're loved here and they feel safe here. And that was a problem for him. And so what I do is ask people, and what I ask this pastor, what do you want them to do? If a student comes to me and he's crying and he says, I realize who I am and I'm afraid because of my parents and I'm afraid because of the church and what you say about God, what do I do? I said, what do you want me to tell him? And he said, uh, 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 and I said, what? And he said, just tell them it's not God's best for them. And I said, what if authenticity is actually God's best for them? I think it is. Um, so there's no blanket statement. You've just got to understand how the person reached, what's the why of their theology, and so that you can unpack it a little bit. Um, you know, I, was, I was, remember being at a conference for LGBTQ Christians and people who support them, and I was talking with a lesbian teenager. We were sitting having coffee in the hotel uh, Starbucks there, and I was like, you know, we're talking about stuff like this. And she says, John, you know, I, I agree with all you're saying about equality and justice and loving the other, especially loving people who disagree with you. She said, but what am I supposed to do about him? And she looks out the window and outside is who I've called Southern Baptist sign guy. Uh-huh. <laughs> he's got a sign and a bullhorn and he says he's going to hell for who she is and who she loves. And she says, how do I love him? And I wanted to phone a friend because I realized I was asking a lot of her. That's something we want to remember. When we try to bring disparate people together, we always want to err on the side of the marginalized person, the vulnerable person, the oppressed person, because they're sacrificing more to be there. But I said, well, what we do is we look at Southern Baptist sign guy and realize he was not born Southern Baptist sign guy. He has a family in which he was raised. He has words spoken into his life. He has a church. He has a voice in his head about what God is saying about him that tells him that he has to be doing that. So right now, even though we think he's horrible and even though what he's doing is so damaging to you, he thinks in his head that he's doing something beautiful. And what we want to remember with opposite theology or oppositional theology is that everyone thinks they're doing it right or they wouldn't be doing it. They think their motives are pure. They think their cause is just. They think their manner is beautiful. So that's what we do. We help people see the results of their theology. Where do you see the inclusive church in 20 years? Where are people starting to create that vision today? (laughs) I'm going to say this in a church filled with people. (laughs) By the way, I'll be here on Sunday morning as well. (laughs) I tell a lot of people who ask me, they always go, what's the future of the church? Um, I think the future of the church is being defined by the people who are leaving it because they're forcing the church to ask questions. And most churches, if they're self-aware or they're paying attention or they're honest, they're kind of scared because they see the attrition. They see congregations getting older. Churches I go to all the time, you know, they haven't filled back up after COVID, on and on and on. But I said to them, the work I do, I'm really fortunate. The, the blog that I started 10 years ago, long ago passed 100 million views. 100 million. But that isn't about my writing. What that is, it's confirmation that people who think and feel the things that we're talking about are there. And so they're not counted in churches on Sunday, many of them. But there is a spiritual movement happening. It's really just about us connecting and figuring out how we do that together. So the future of the church is going to be about what we're doing tonight, we're doing in a church. So there are beautiful communities of faith doing brave, bold, courageous, loving work. However, if this wasn't a church and we were saying the exact same things... Well, that's pretty much church. We are people who are trying to be changed by what we believe, and we're going to go and try to alter the world. So the church is going to continue to be the church as a movement. It's just maybe not going to be for an hour on Sunday in the same building. That's what I'd say. Lancaster City has way too many unsheltered and hungry people for its size. How do we as a faith community bring change, bring hope, or bring help for permanent solutions? I think churches, a church like this, it's, it's, 
I'm talking about many churches that this church is not. So many churches, they don't, they want to talk about compassion, but when you ask them to do something that is truly compassionate, compassion really requires a spending of yourself on behalf of someone. You have to give something away. And I don't think churches often want to get into the messy business of what would it be like if we leverage this building not for the people who are already here or to get them to come back, but to really be a place where people are fed and clothed and given rest and seen. So it's really about how do we do church in a way that is so radically different from the way we've understood. There's a church, some friends of mine in Minnesota, and they actually had their sanctuary burned down. They were a victim of arson and they started to rebuild their church and they said, wait, before we rebuild this church, we better think about all the things that we used to do that maybe we shouldn't have been doing or that were a waste of our time or waste of energy or waste of the resources. And let's rebuild the church in the image that we believe it should be. And what that means is they're asking fundamental questions with each other like, do we need a Sunday service with music and readings? By the way, come on Sunday, please. (laughs) Sorry. and, I'm, and that's where I'm saying is churches need to say, all, there are no rules. We may have some denominational things and traditions, but we can actually create anything we want. And it doesn't have to look like it used to, and it can't. So um, we have to wake up our imaginations about what the work of God could look like. It was really powerful. Um, How do we address the climate crisis in a way that people can get the existential threat? The world is dying. Here's, Here's the problem we have. Many of the people we want to reach with the message of the damage that's happening to the planet are kind of okay with it because it means they're gonna get to meet Jesus sooner. You think it's funny, but it isn't. There there is a feeling, there is a a theological idea that, uh, you know, I wanna meet the Lord as soon as possible, so this life, it really doesn't matter. And that's really what you see in a theology that is afterlife focused, right? That it wants to get people saved and into heaven. And, and Jesus is there. I always tell, tell conservative Christians, I said, you know, if Jesus was just about getting people to heaven, the Gospels would be much shorter. It would be like a really good altar call, and that's it. But what do we have? We've got these four biographies with stories about Jesus eating with people and walking through the world and living alongside others and treat, showing them how to treat people. So how we act and what we do has to matter, Right. Um, And if you can't show people that the beauty around you, if you believe that God provided it, then you need to steward it. And it's really about pulling the Bible on them and go, okay, all this stuff in Genesis, all this beautiful stuff, how do you feel about that? Do you want to honor it the way that God asks you to honor it? And you pull little Jesus juke on them, as they say. (laughs) Ultimately, if they're compassionate people, if they have any sort of humanity, they're going to begin to understand that we have a responsibility to reflect Jesus to the planet as well as to people. But it's usually many of the same people push against both of those things when asked to do it. What is your favorite Bible story or a fable or something of that uh, nature and why and how does it inform your life? I've always resonated with a man who's daughter is sick and he goes to Jesus for healing and he basically says Jesus my daughter is sick help her I believe help my unbelief because I don't believe he is basically a walking contradiction and I recognize that and for for the same reason I love that story that I sit with the Psalms all the time and what I do is I can see in the Psalms, the Psalms are basically worship songs, they're poetry, right? They're basically but a, an artistic journal. And what's beautiful is you can look at the Psalms and go, in this writing, the Psalmist is going, God, you are provider and you love me and your love washes over me. And the next one he's going, God, I don't even know if you're listening. 
And the next one, he goes, God, you're not paying attention. Would you get over here and help us? Don't you care? That I really resonate with. So it's that idea of someone holding their inconsistencies. I'll tell you how this all figures in. Uh, years ago, my first book was called The Bigger Table, and it was about creating redemptive spiritual community among disparate people where everyone could be seen and heard and respected. And I b- firmly believed in that. I wrote that in 2015, right? <laughs> and then 2016 happened and some things after that, yada, yada, yada. And I started to realize maybe I don't want the table as big as I actually thought. <laughs> Because now there were people I was hesitant to welcome. And I've been facing my own fraudulence, my own consistency, and my own hypocrisy. So you combine those things, and that's why I love the story of someone saying to Jesus, help me with, you know, I believe, help me with my unbelief, and why I love the Psalms where there's just this constant vacillation. And it's why when I was a pastor, I realized they wanted me to preach about questions, but I couldn't preach about all the questions. I could ask this, but if I ask this, oh, that's a liability. So, um, yeah, I love authenticity in the scripture. Okay, this is a personal question for you. Um, How is your health? You gave us a scare a few years ago. My health, Um, yeah, I think I'm okay. (laughs) Um, It's funny, when I wrote A Bigger Table, I wish you could have seen me back then. I was effervescent, I was bubbly. I believe I looked like a young Brad Pitt. I don't know what happened. (laughs) But anyway, my health. So yeah, we were, we were getting ready to launch um, my, my book, If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk. And I remember I started not feeling well. I had COVID. They thought I was getting over it, and I wasn't. And I went to the doctor, and he, quick story, he just goes, oh, we're going to check some blood work. And he gets blood work back, and he goes, hmm, something here on this blood work. I, this could be really outside chance. It could be this kind of tumor, but it could be. And so he goes, probably not, but let's check. And he does another test. He goes, okay, well, it is that tumor. It is a tumor, but it could be one of three types. And this one, we just watch. This one, we have medication for. Only this one needs to be surgically removed. Well, here's the one you have. So then I had, you know, brain surgery three days after my book came out. So it was great because I could say, I had a book and a brain tumor come out in the same week. And... (laughs) Short answer, long answer to that is, you know, they removed most of the tumor. There was part of it they couldn't get, but medication has been managing it. I'm feeling well. Whatever I said was incoherent tonight. I'll blame that on residual tumor, but thank you for asking. I'm feeling really well. I'm able to do work that I love. And the doctor recently said to me, her words were, wow. And she said, I don't want to see you for another year, which is what you want to hear. So thank you. Maybe she just didn't like me. I don't know. So I think this is a really, this will be our last question, and I think this is a really good question for us to um, end with before I pass it over to you, John. So there's a lot of talk about grief, and I think that, um, I know that that resonates with people very deeply, particularly in our community, but where do we find that hope? How do we cultivate that hope when we are so deep in the grief? Yeah, you know, I don't want to do a crass commercial, seriously, but at 9.30 tomorrow morning, we're going to be talking about how to cultivate hope in difficult times. We're going to lean into compassion fatigue and how to help yourself. The, The quick answer would be to realize that there are two wounds in the world. There's the wounds of the world and the wounds we sustain attending to them. And most of the time we're focused on the wounds of the world and never focusing on the wounds that we sustain attending to them. And it's time that we realize that the most precious gift that we have as activists and caregivers and lovers of humanity is ourselves. And so we need to start caring for ourselves. And sometimes that means you need to pull away from the fray and be re-energized and recalibrated so that you can go back to the work. It's not a betrayal of the work. It's actually honoring the work because you're gonna be a fully formed human being. Um, Most of us have gotten so used to getting our identity by caregiving and doing and activism and showing up that we are not, we are not longer, uh, we're no longer respecting our humanity. And someone said to me recently, John, you have to allow yourself to be human or this is all fraudulent. Um, so we have to be human. Um, we, we can talk about that tomorrow. If, uh, just if you will be here, it will be an honor to do that. Okay, so a few things before we um, wrap up. I will be staying after, uh, sign books and say hello and all that good stuff. So... 
You know, these, these days have been difficult, right? And what I think is going to happen is tomorrow is not necessarily going to be easier. We're not standing, though, where billions of others haven't stood before, watching what seems like this march of hatred and fascism and autocracy arriving and feeling hopelessness creep up in our bodies like a flood. We are not the first people to experience that, right? And in every such time and place, despite the dwindling odds and the mounting terrors and the vanishing options, the good people have done what good people always do. They've bravely and steadfastly spent themselves on behalf of those who would follow them so they might inherit something a little more beautiful and a little less violent than had they never lived. I know you wondered why you're here. You're here because you want this life to matter. You want you to matter. And I know you've experienced losses and we've seen political losses and the loss of civil rights and the loss of human rights and it's terrifying, right? But what's amazing is to think about is anything we feel like we're, we've lost or we're losing or we are in danger of losing is because someone fought so we could have those things to begin with. The right for women to have autonomy over their bodies or the rights of all people to marry the person they love, the rights of women and people of color to vote, these were all products of the collective sustained efforts of millions of people who came before us and we owe a debt of gratitude to them and part of that gratitude is refusing to become so tired or so frustrated or so angry that we give up. That is not acceptable. We are part of a continuum of compassionate activists, a long lineage of dam givers. This letter came to me a few years ago, and if you could see it, the handwriting looks like it's written by the machine, it's so precise, and I rarely get letters like this in the mail, but it was from a 94-year-old woman raised in the Netherlands under Hitler, whose family was tortured and killed in Dachau, and she told me she saw history repeating here, and she urged me to keep fighting. She's urging you to keep fighting too. See, every day in my travels, both in person and online, people say, how do you stay hopeful right now? I say, because they pay me to. <laughs> no, they don't. I tell them I stay hopeful because hopelessness is not an option. I tell them I stay hopeful for Anne Frank. The Jewish teenager wrote these words in the early 1940s while confined within the cramped upper rooms of an Amsterdam business that became her entire world for three years of her far too brief life as her family hid from the Nazis. She said this, it's really a wonder that I haven't dropped all my ideals because they seem so absurd and impossible to carry out, yet I keep them because in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. Every time I read or I think of those words, I remember why I stay hopeful. I stay hopeful because she stayed hopeful. Despite every reason to abandon the will to continue or the optimism to sustain her, she refused to. The beautiful defiance of her young heart in those words is reason enough to keep going. See, hopelessness is defeat and it's resignation, it's willing surrender to the darkness and it insults the memory of so many who came before us, who made this planet their home. And I stay hopeful because people of every nationality and religious affiliation and life circumstance who have preceded us have experienced all manner of hell and they refuse to stop. That's the reason why we're still here. It's why we have something worth losing to begin with. And now it's our turn. This is our moment to spend our fragile and fleeting sliver of space and time here. And for the sake of our predecessors, precedent, predecessors in humanity and our descendants, we can't blow it. It doesn't really matter what someone else does or how they vote or whatever movement or whoever politicians are in power. What matters is what you are going to do with the life that you have.
I often ask people just to remind themselves that they're here. Because when people go, nobody cares anymore, I say, do you care? Well, yeah, but okay. There's no one left of any compassion. Do you have compassion? I try. Okay. Part of it is the story that we tell ourselves, and we have to start telling ourselves, all is not lost. You're here and you're alive, and so don't waste your chance, right? You know, we hear that quote from Fred Rogers. When I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news. My mother would say, look for the helpers. You always find people who are helping. We don't have to look for the helpers. We get to be the people that those looking for help see. What a gift that is. What an honor. That's why as terrible as the times are individually and collectively, we were made for days like these. When people wonder if caring human beings still exist, we get to tell them yes. When they ask if there are spiritual communities who see the humanity of LGBTQ people, we can say yes. When vulnerable people wonder if they're alone, we can assure them that they are not. So yeah, you've lost some things. And you've been grieving. And I I hear the question you ask yourself a million times a day. Has a good portion of this country lost its soul, or is it me? And it isn't you. The fact that you see how bad things are means your faculties are intact. It means your mind is fully right. It means your heart is still working properly. It means you still have a soul doing what a soul is required to do, keep you deeply human and profoundly in humane times. So if you came in here tonight grieving, celebrate it. It means that you are still here. See, I told you when we began that I'm a collector of stories and I'm a war correspondent. There's a pattern to what people share with me. Whether it's a transgender teenager or a Muslim activist or a migrant father or racial justice workers, they never say to me, John, as a white cisgender heterosexual pastor, could you be less bold Could you be less loud? Could you be less confrontational? What they usually say is, why are so many good people of faith so silent right now? Why is the only expression of Christianity I see something that is is exclusionary and predatory and hateful? And that's where many of you get to step in. That's your invitation. There is a Pennsylvania that's worth fighting for. There is an America that's worth fighting for. There are disparate human beings that are worth fighting for, and we are those fighters because you can be loud and loving at the same time. I didn't come here to tell you how bad things are. You know that or you wouldn't be here. I'm here to remind you how good you are. Tonight is not about anyone else's inhumanity, it's about your humanity. It's not about one group of people's cruelty. It's about your empathy. A gentleman said to me, John, I have two news feeds in my life. There's the big and distant, and that's the loud. It's going to be the news. It's going to be social media. He said, if I look at that distant news feed, it's always going to be hate. It's always going to be division. It's always going to be the worst of the worst. And he said, if I only focus on that news feed, I'm going to get overwhelmed. He said, but there's a second news feed. It's in the small and close. It's in the places where I live and walk, in the people's names who I know, and in the stories and the churches and all the things that I see. And he said, if I'm on that news feed a lot, It's impossible to be hopeless because I know what's going on there. And so part of what's going to happen is we're going to stay in the story and work on the system. We're going to stay in the small and close and here and now and doable. You have two things at all times. You have proximity and agency. You have a group of people, humanity that you are close to, and you have the ability to do something about that. Proximity and agency. You have it no matter what the news is, no matter what's trending, no matter how you think the world is. 
Doesn't matter who's in the seats of power. Doesn't matter how the horrible legislation that gets passed. It doesn't matter how much the evangelical church rejects Jesus. Doesn't matter how compromised the courts become. It doesn't matter how predatory the preachers or the politicians are. That is almost irrelevant. Their violence is not the point. Your capacity to love is the point. And that love, friends, it's our only hope and it's our only plan. People have been saying, John, the sky feels like it's falling. And I said, in times like this, then we just hold up the sky. Be encouraged. All is not lost. You are here. Do the beautiful work you can. Leverage your voice and your talents and your time and your resources and your circle of influence and just love in the ways that you can. Thanks for being with us tonight. I'm honored by your presence. Go in peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. John, thank you for being here with us tonight, and we thank all of you for joining us, as well as those of you who are joining online, and we'll watch this later. We would like to invite you to go downstairs. Uh, there are some snacks available, uh, some refreshments. If you'd like to continue to be small and close, you can do that uh, downstairs in Fellowship Hall. We would also like to invite you, uh, as John had mentioned, that this coming Sunday and two days from now, uh, we will meet in this place for worship at 10.15, uh, but at 9.15 we will meet downstairs for a Q&A with John during our adult faith formation hour. So again, we invite you to join us on Sunday, uh, but right now we invite you to come downstairs. Uh, there will be some merchandise down there, um, as well as John uh, being available to sign some books. So thank you again for coming, uh, and we hope to see you downstairs and see you on Sunday. Go in peace.